910, Big 550, KTRS. And it was back on November 24th, that Monday night, the Monday before Thanksgiving, that our next guest held a news conference in uh, which was carried uh, worldwide, in which he uh, detailed why the grand jury in St. Louis County decided to uh, not indict Officer Wilson on any charge. And since that night... Uh, much has been talked about, much has been criticized about his process and what happened. And, of course, we had the riots and the fires, and Ferguson became a international story and remains one today. Bob McCullough held that news conference back on November 24th and joins us now. Give for the me first, about 30 more seconds. Jo- joins us now here uh, to talk about uh, what has transpired over the last month and what transpired on that November 24th. Bob McCullough, of course, is the St. Louis County prosecutor, and I believe we have him via a telephonic setup. He's calling back in. He's calling right back. We found him on a cell phone. We're going to call him back on a landline. We're going to do that here here in uh, just a moment. We so, got him. All right, good. Uh, Bob McCullough, St. Louis County prosecutor, are you there? I am. Thank you very much for joining us. This is the first time you've had a chance to sit down and at least uh, tell us your thoughts since that November 24th uh, news conference that you held that night, that Monday before Thanksgiving. Just give us a sense of of what your thoughts have been as you've watched the last month from where you've been. Well, I'm happy to see and tell you the truth that that things have, have calmed down to the point where People are beginning to rationally discuss the issues that are out there, and that's that's what we need to do in order to to accomplish anything. So, um, and in, in all honesty, I intentionally stayed away from all the media for that very purpose. I didn't want to uh, fire things up. I didn't want anybody to be able to say, "Well, McCullough said this, he did that," and and so so I stayed away from it. And I think now, you know, it's a point where where those discussions will go on, and hopefully, we'll we'll get something accomplished this time. And so you want to you want to you want to come on and just um, state a couple things, explain a couple things. What's your reasoning for coming on yeah. now? Well, I think there there are a couple things that have that developed in the past month, um, uh, past month that that you know, I think I can straighten out. You know, there, there was a lot of talk about the timing, the actual timing of the release, um, some of the other things about the release of the grand jury information and and the uh, federal investigation and the like. So. Uh, rather than you know, <laughs> listen to all the talking heads I've heard about uh, explaining why I did what I did, I thought I'd come on and explain it. All right, good. Let's start with the timing. Back on November 24th, you right. announced it uh, after dark, right. uh, in which many people said that was probably the worst time to announce something like that. Why did you choose to do it then? Well, the, the, um, you know, there was a lot that went into that. You know, there, there was no good time to, to announce this. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen. We, we knew that very early on. Uh, but I did work very closely with law enforcement, uh, in particular with Chief Belmer uh, and the rest of the, uh, the command staff to, uh, on, the, on that timing. I decided early on that, that I would release it as soon as practicable after, after the grand jury made the decision. The problem, of course, is that uh, neither I nor anyone else knew exactly when they would make the decision. We had a good idea that, of course, when they finished the, hearing all the evidence, they would deliberate and make a decision. But even then, until they make one, we don't know. Mm-hmm. So there was a good chance that uh, cause they, they completed hearing the evidence on Friday the 21st, and they started deliberating then. Um, and so if, if they had um, uh, reached a decision then, it would have been released sometime over the weekend. The problem was that uh, they didn't reach a decision, and, and uh, excuse me, and came back on Monday to to finish their deliberations. And so once they did that, then uh, the county police, uh, all the police departments were were on full alert for that weekend. Uh, we were we were fairly certain something was going to be reached that weekend, but um, so they were all in place, they were all set, they were all ready to go. And I spoke with the Chief Balmer on Sunday night. Um, and, and he thought that it would be, and I, I agreed with it uh, absolutely. That uh, if we can, as soon as we can release it, the better we can release it, the better it is. They were already on full alert; they're already there. Uh, they're in position. At least all the law enforcement were in position. 
And so um, we did that as quickly as we could. So the, the information that it leaked out uh, nationally, Washington right. Post, CNN, some of those others started to leak out that the grand jury had come to a decision. And then it the answer, the decision leaked out even before you ever reached the podium. Once that started to leak, did you feel you had to rush to get out that information sooner rather than maybe the next morning? Well, I... Uh, I did not know. I didn't hear anything about the uh, the actual decision uh, leaking out uh, because, it, it, in all honesty, it was probably somebody guessing at that because there were only a limited number, only about four people in addition to the grand jurors who, who knew what the decision was. But I did want to get it out as quickly as possible. As I said, it, it was, and I know the media had reported that it was going to be released on Sunday, that the decision was made and all that. Uh, and, and, and as I said, we, we thought that there was a good chance of that happening. So I thought it was important to, to, to get it released whenever it came back as quickly as possible afterwards. And so it took a while to, to kind of prepare things. You know, you can't just uh, walk out and do that. Um, you know, the, the media, you know, the news directors from the three uh, local TV stations did just a great job in, in setting things up. But it takes a few hours for that to get finished. We also had uh, some work to do. We had to notify certain people. Um, and make some preparations, and so we got it out as soon as we could. In 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 hindsight, would you have wished to have waited till the next morning and release it at say nine o'clock in the morning, as opposed to eight thirty nine nine o'clock at night? No, no, I, I don't think so. I don't have any any regrets about that. The uh, what occurred afterwards was was unfortunate. There are a variety of, of reasons that 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 may have occurred, and some people were bent on destruction, regardless of when this was going to be released. But I thought it was more important to get the information out as, as quickly as possible. Um, and, and just waiting, I think waiting longer uh, would have aggravated things. You, you also have the issue with schools being open. Um, you know, by, by releasing it in the evening, we had schools were closed. They had the chance to close for the next day. Businesses had an opportunity. A, a lot of businesses would have been closed anyway. Uh, but they also had the opportunity to make sure and make arrangements. And, and, and you know, there were a lot of moving parts on that, and it had to get in there. So um, I, I don't think it uh, I don't think it would have made a whole lot of difference. You know, you know, the people who were bent on destruction, you know, those weren't demonstrations. They're not demonstrators. They're just common criminals. There, much has been made about the, the fact that, that you released the information. Is all of the information out, and are you expecting to release any more? Um, I believe all of it is out. I don't. Uh, I don't expect to release any more. But uh, what happened is, you know, that was an, another part of it um, that we had to get everything in, in order. I wanted to release the information as soon as I finished uh, uh, the announcement, and we did release uh, uh, as much as we could. Um, there was some that we missed, and that was pointed out to me by actually by Channel Five, a report they did, uh, in which, frankly, they had an awful lot of stuff just plain wrong. Um, but they corrected that and, and, and apologized for that. But they did point out that uh, that we had not released some of the FBI statements, or at least Dorian Johnson. So I went back and, and we, we gathered that information. And we did, in fact, we missed about a dozen. Um, it's not that we didn't have them. It's just that, uh, you know, in, in getting everything ready, we, we neglected to uh, to release those or include those in the original release. So it took a while to get to get those redacted and get them prepared and, and everything and then get them up on that website. And so we got those out as quickly as we could. We also came across a couple of uh, reports that had not been released. One was the uh, the federal autopsy report. And so, so there were a couple other documents that were also released with that. So um, I'm pretty sure that everything is out there right now. And, you know, I learned never to say never. So but if we come across something that wasn't released, we'll, we'll get it released right away. Uh, there was uh, a criticism that uh, of the prosecutor that the, you allowed witnesses, and I know you're not going to necessarily speak specifically on, on witnesses, but you allowed witnesses who you and your staff questioned their reliability, questioned whether they actually were there, had the right Im information, their stories changed once they were uh, questioned about it. Why did you allow people to testify in front of the grand jury in which you knew they their information was either flat out wrong or flat out lying or just weren't telling the truth? Well, early on, I decided that, that uh, anyone who claimed to have witnessed anything was, was going to be presented to the grand jury, that... Um, 
and I knew that no matter how I handled this, there would be criticism of it. And so if I didn't put those witnesses on, then we'd be discussing now why I didn't put those witnesses on, even though, you know, and, and you know, even though the, their statements were not accurate. Um, and so my determination was to put everybody on and, and uh, you know, let the grand jurors assess their credibility, which they did. I mean, this grand jury poured their hearts and souls into this, and it was a very emotional um, a few months for, for, for them. It took a lot out of them physically and emotionally. So, but I wanted to put everything on there. I, and, and I knew, I said, somebody would be critical of whatever I did, however I did it, even those who, first of all, we didn't release any information, and then we released too much information. And so, you know, that just goes with the territory. But I thought it was much more important to present anybody and everybody and some that yes clearly we're not telling the truth no question about it you don't do that normally so that was something you right. did differently because of this case correct yeah it it, it the, the entire thing you know grand juries are, are not just um they also have some investigatory powers and that's what they were they were this was part of it here it was in addition to presenting a case to a grand jury there's you know they were doing some investigation and so part of that is interviewing witnesses and bringing those witnesses in to testify and looking at documents and doing the like. So it was, uh, it was a lot different. Normally there's not, uh, the investigation is done by the police beforehand, and then the information or the evidence is presented to the, uh, to the grand jury, uh, grand jurors in a more condensed fashion. But in this case, again, I thought it was very important. You know, there were, there were people, first of all, questioning whether I'd be fair or not. And so, um, so to make sure that you know we were as open as possible, we presented it to the grand jury to let them make the decision. It's not as though we just, you know, some of these pundits have said, we just opened the door and threw everything in and said, here, do what you're going to do. I mean, it, it was, if you've you know, had a chance to look at even parts of the transcript and the evidence in the case, you can see how well organized it was, and it was all put before the grand jury in an orderly fashion, not, not some willy-nilly fashion. And they have the whole range, as a grand jury does on, on every case, as to uh, any potential charges. One of the criticisms was that Officer Wilson testified and testified for a number of hours, and he right. testified um, that in, in a way in which he wasn't cross-examined. So his opinion and his story was told in its entirety, but Michael Brown didn't have a chance to testify in front of that grand jury. Well, and, and obviously Michael Brown couldn't testify in front of the grand jury, but Wilson, you know, any, any target, any suspect on any investigation, I would love to have in front of the grand jury, but, but we can't compel someone to come in and testify if they're the target of the investigation, if they're a potential defendant. And so in some cases, we invite them to come in, and, and in some cases, in uh, most cases, they, they declined. In this case, he, he decided to come in and testify. Uh, and and believe me, I, I would take a statement, a sworn statement from a potential target on on every case. I'd love to have that. You know, we've had other situations in which, in fact, there's a guy being sentenced this morning, a, a former police chief from uh, Charlac, uh, who was uh, indicted by a grand jury for stealing from the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he was invited to come in and testify. He came in and testified, and the grand jury uh, considered his testimony and indicted him. Uh, and then he was tried by a jury and convicted just recently and is being sentenced this morning. So, so it, uh, you know, sometimes they, uh, they believe the individual, sometimes they don't, sometimes it's, you know, a little bit of everything. Uh, just like any jury, they can, they can believe all part or nothing of, of any witness testimony. Crit criticism of you, Bob McCullough, was that if you wanted to, you could have gotten this grand jury to bring an indictment. And I've asked you this before, and I'm going to ask you it again. And that is, you could have, as you, as I'm assuming you do in certain other cases, where if you think someone's guilty, you, you sort of bring the evidence that you want to a grand jury so they indict. You didn't do that this, this time. Well, we could have presented the evidence in, in such a skewered fashion to, yes, to get anything that... Uh, you know, that anybody wanted out of there. If I'd put on just Dorian Johnson, they would have indicted him on murder in the first degree. Uh, but that wasn't the case, and that wasn't the whole case. And so th this, this case was different, and it's not uncommon in a case where, where there are issues of whether it's legal self-defense or lawful self-defense or, or lawful use of force by a law enforcement officer. Those are issues that have to go in. You know, if there's a shopkeeper who, who shoots a robber, 
you know, you know that's that's information that's going to be put in there. This guy was robbing the store, and that's why the guy shot him, as opposed to just putting on evidence to say, hey, this guy pulled a gun out and shot this guy and killed him. Uh, so we, my job is not to get an indictment. My job is to, to seek the truth and seek justice and do what is, what is right and what's appropriate in there, and that's, that's what we did in this case and when, all other cases. When the decision was made and you made that uh, statement, there was then video shortly after that that has been released that had, uh, Michael Brown's stepfather standing on top of a, right. a, a crowd yelling, uh, burn this place down. And there's some question of whether or not he's being in, in investigated. Do you know anything about his investigation? And, and is it possible he might be charged with something for that? I don't know there's a, an investigation. I, I think part of the overall investigation into the, uh, to the destruction that night, it, he'll certainly be part of that. But, you know, I don't envision, you know, I don't know some people are saying, well, you ought to charge him with inciting a riot. Well, first of all, there is no such charge in the state of Missouri as inciting a riot. Second, um, you know, when he's yelling to burn, burn the place down, you know, they didn't burn. Nobody burned down the police station, which is where he was. And so, yeah, I, 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 I doubt, unless there's something changes drastically, I doubt there'd be any kind of charges that would come out of it. So. Is there anybody you're thinking about charging for uh, with perjury for going in front of the grand jury, calling you up, giving you false information, uh, co- charging them with some type of perjury? You know, that, that was, and that issue has been raised, and it's a legitimate issue, but in the situation, again, because of the, the manner in, in which we did it, you know, we're not going to file perjury charges against anyone. There, there were people who came in and, yes, absolutely lied under oath. Some lied to the FBI. Even though they're not under oath, that's another potential offense, a federal offense. But um, I thought it was much more important to present the entire picture and say, listen, this is what this witness says he saw even though there was a building between where the witness says he was and where the events occurred. Um, and so they couldn't have seen that. Or uh, the physical evidence didn't support what the witness was saying. Uh, and it was on, you know, it went both directions. There's, there's talk of one witness now, and, 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 you know, some of the media is doing exactly what I said they would do. They'd pull out one witness and just latch on to that. And this was a lady who clearly wasn't present uh, when this occurred. And she, she recounted the statement that was you know, right out of the newspaper about, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Wilson's actions and right down the line with Wilson's actions, even though I'm sure she was nowhere near the place. But there were other witnesses, too, like I said, who said, well, I saw this whole thing, and even though there was a, an apartment building between me and where this happened, um, you know, but but I thought it was much more important that uh, the grand jury hear everything, what people have to say. And they're in a perfect position to assess the credibility, which is what jurors do. Do you, do you think that the the grand jury gave that that witness any credibility when she no. went up on stand? No, no, no. I mean, none, none whatsoever. I mean, it was, it was perfect. The, the one thing that changed in her in her story several times is that is the reason she happened to be in Canfield that day. Um, she changed that, but she never did change. You know, her her description of what she claims to have seen. Uh, also, uh, Bob McCullough, just a couple more minutes here uh, with you. There was um, an incident in which um, there was somebody who, who claimed during the grand jury while we were waiting that she knew someone on the grand jury and tweeted something right. out. You investigated it and said that there was absolutely no leak whatsoever. Correct. However, there were a number of leaks that came out, and it seemed like they came through the Justice Department in Washington. C- can you can you confirm that? And did those leaks actually hinder you in your job? Um, you know, certainly. I mean, by just going by what was reported in the, I think it was the it was either New York Times uh, or the Washington Post. One of them, you know, published uh, uh, Wilson's account. Um, but they said they got it from a government official in D.C. who had been briefed on that. Well, I don't have any government officials in D.C., so the only ones there are the Justice Department. So, yeah, I have no doubt that that's where it came from. It really it, it didn't hinder the investigation because the grand jury had already heard all of that information. So they had already, they had already reviewed it. Um, Wilson had already testified when the... When the um, autopsy report was published by the Post-Dispatch. You know, that was one that, that I know did not come from the grand jury because of the, the markings on that, on the report that they published were different from the ones that we have. And so we know it didn't come from us, and we know it didn't come from the county police. And that doesn't leave too many other people. So uh, I'm suspecting that came from the Justice Department also. 
But in any event, uh, again, the, the grand jury had already seen the autopsy report. They had already heard from the pathologist, uh, two pathologists, in fact. And so it really didn't hinder, uh, hinder their function, uh, although it created issues because you know it, it just it just fueled the fire you know and now people are making decisions again based on bits and pieces of information instead of all the information the justice department is investigating whether or not uh, michael brown's civil rights were violated you've said on this program yeah. before that everything you have they have and everything they have right. you have um right. are they taking too long why are they taking longer than you are what's what's keeping them from making a decision you know, I, I have no idea. There, there are no other witnesses, and they have every uh, witness statement. Uh, you know, if a, if a witness testified in front of the grand jury on a Tuesday, then by Thursday the Justice Department had the testimony of that witness. They have all the reports. They did their own examinations. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it's been 25 days you know, since, the, uh, since the grand jury reached its decision, and, and there's still nothing from the, from the Department of Justice, their report. But I, I just hope they're not going to wait until they finish Trayvon Martin before they start on this report. So that's that's just not right. It's is not there fair. is there anything, Bob McCullough, that you wish you would have done differently? You know, I, we will we will dissect this as we do with a lot of a lot of things and look back and 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 see what um, you know what can be done or what we could do. And and at this point, you know, there's there's not a whole lot. Now there's. You know, I probably would have spoke out more about, you know, particularly when they, people were talking about, you know, my inability to be fair because of my background. You know, my father was a police officer killed. What they ignored, and, and this tells you just how opportunistic some of the uh, some of the politicians were in doing that, is that what they ignored is that on the 5th of July, about a month before Michael Brown was killed, a, a Pine Lawn police officer shot and killed an unarmed man. And what Pine Lawn did was immediately call the St. Louis County Police and ask them to handle the investigation, which they did. They ran that investigation. They completed it in mid-October of this year, and they presented it to me. And we reviewed everything. One of my prosecutors did. My chief investigator reviewed it. I reviewed it. We then uh, had the police do some additional investigation on it and then uh, completed everything and, and released the, uh, the information. We looked at it and made a determination that it was indeed a, a tragic yes, but a justified uh, use of force by a law enforcement officer. We provided that information to back to the county police department, of course, but also to the Pine Lawn Police Department. And you know, not a word was raised about that, my inability to be fair and impartial in that case. You know, so it just tells you how phony the, the, the arguments and the claims were that I'm looking at the same thing. A, a, actually, it was a white police officer who shot and killed an unarmed black man. We looked at the identical thing, and not a single person, not a single one of these politicians raised the issue of my fairness in that case. And the only difference is it was a Pine Lawn case as opposed to a Ferguson case. So, um, and, and, you know, I mean, there was, you know, the chief of police in Pine Lawn, he received a copy of all this, or the superintendent or the uh, director of public safety or whatever title uh, Mr. Gray has in Pine Lawn. Um, you know, it was presented to them, and, you know, in one minute they're claiming I can't be fair because my father was an officer killed in the line of duty 50 years ago, and at the same time they have absolutely no objection to the manner in which the county police and the county prosecutor reviewed the July 5th shooting. So it, it just tells you... Uh, I think demonstrates just how phony that uh, that argument was. Is there anything, Bob McCullough, that uh, you haven't said that you wish you would have said something you wanted to say today that I didn't ask you about that you want to set the record straight on? You know, off the, the top of my head, I can't. But it was like um, you know, it's kind of like a closing argument you make in every trial. As soon as you're finished, you think, oh, "I wish I would have <laughs> said this or, or said that." So. Um, not that I regretted saying anything I've said, but uh, there's there are some things that uh, you know something always comes to you when you're when sure. you're finished. So, well, it, no, I I think it does, and and you know I think I kind of uh, covered everything. Uh, if you have other questions, I'll be happy. To no, my my only other question, and I I just want to end with, and, the, and that is the, uh, on the way the system is set up. Do you do you think it's do you think prosecutors are too close to police? To investigate, you work with them on all these other crimes. Sure. Is are you too close? Is it should a special prosecutor be set up? Should should it, should it be taken out of your office to investigate something next next time? No, it, it shouldn't. And as I said, it, it 
if you look at the history that's been there, you know, we've prosecuted, in my office alone, I've prosecuted more than 50 police officers for everything. As I said, uh, Tony Umbertino, the former chief of Charlotte, is being prosecuted or is being sentenced this morning. Uh, for stealing from the city of uh, of Charlotte while he was the chief of police. So, you know, it, it has not hindered uh, our ability to look at these things. And people are, have that, uh, some, I won't say everybody, of course, but uh, some people have the idea that, you know, the, the police are going to protect the police. You know, there, there's nobody who dislikes a dishonest cop more than other cops because they tarnish everybody with that. And we don't like dishonest people regardless of their occupation. So we've prosecuted police over the years. As I said, this July 5th shooting, um, you know, nobody questioned that. I, I've been looking and reviewing police shootings for, you know, for 20 years. And uh, the Post, the Washington Post, you know, they wanted to inquire about these, these three cases in which we didn't file any charges because these white police officers killed uh, uh, black suspects. Well, when they found out that they were indeed black police officers who fired the shots, and and that one of the uh, uh, one of the decedents was a white guy, um, you know that was the last you ever heard of it, you know. But nobody ever questioned our ability to be fair and impartial in those cases. It's it's only when they saw an opportunity for their pure political gain, far too many of these people um, started raising that issue, and that's that's where it came from. And, and, and really, you only need to look at the July fifth one. Anthony Gray had no complaint or quarrel about my ability to be fair and impartial in, in uh, a Pine Lawn shooting. But less than a month later, all of a sudden, we can't be trusted to do this right. So it just sort of that, shows you how devious that, uh, that uh, argument was. That, that Pine Lawn shooting, their, their police chief, Anthony Gray, uh, is also the family attorney for, 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 for Michael Brown. So in, in one instance, was he working with you as the police chief? And in the other instance, working against you as Michael Brown's uh, family's attorney? Well, as the uh, as the police chief, you know, because the county police were doing the investigation of the Pine Lawn Department, so there was no or, or the Pine Lawn shooting. You know, there, there's there's no real contact with the uh, the police chief, and because you don't want you know you don't want they don't want to be doing the investigation. We don't want them, so we had really no contact with them. Gotcha. But certainly, you know, he's the superintendent of police or, or the director of public safety, whatever the title is. So it's his call to call in the county police to do the investigation. So, so, so he so, called in the county police sure. for so for, they could be fair and impartial, as could the prosecutor in that situation. But something happened during that uh, that intervening month that all of a sudden none of us could be fair and impartial. Bob McCullough, St. Louis County Prosecuting Attorney. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll talk to you down thank the road. You, you got it. Uh, there you go, Bob McCullough. We'll back in a moment. Big Five Fifty KT.